the next presentation is by Joseph Racino of NASA Jet Propulsion's laboratory entitled Analyzing the Efficacy of Flexible Execution, Replanning, and Plan Optimization for a Planetary Lander. Joseph. Everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, my name is Joe. I'm going to be presenting this work, uh, Modeling Integrated Planning and Execution for a Planetary Lander today. Um, I just wanted to mention this work was led by um, Daniel Wang. Unfortunately, Daniel was unable to participate in this workshop session today. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge him for uh, doing the bulk of this work and also providing this uh, set of slides for, for presentation. Um, if you can go to the next slide, we'll get started. Okay, so um, just for background, this work is done in the context of the Europa Lander mission concept. Uh, the primary goal of the Europa Lander mission concept is to excavate and sample the surface of the Jovian moon Europa um, and to analyze the sampled material for signs of biosignatures and then to communicate that data back to Earth. In addition, there are secondary objectives to take panoramic imagery of the Europa surface um, and also to collect seismographic data um, uh, and if you go to the next slide. Um, this mission concept presents uh, um, a set of challenges that we haven't really faced before on previous flight missions. Um, in particular, uh, there's a finite non-rechargeable battery supply planned. Um, there are large communication blackouts with the Earth. So we're expecting uh, to be out of communication with the lander for 42 out of every 84 hours. Um, and in addition to those things, there's just a, a very um, a, a large unprecedented level of uh, model uncertainty. Um, and, and to be more clear of that, so from a planning perspective, um, we, we reason about a set of tasks the system can perform and the resource use and the likelihood of success of those tasks. Uh, because we know so little about the surface of Europa and because so much of what we would want to do there with a potential lander involves direct interaction with the surface, um, you know, robotic interactions for, for gathering samples, uh, the, the resource use and the likelihood of success of those tasks may vary quite a bit from the prior estimates that we develop on the ground before landing. Go to the next slide. Um, just a little more about these things. So, um, the, the finite non-rechargeable battery supply and these large communication blackouts um, drive uh, our interest in having more significant levels of autonomy on board uh, because the lander has a limited lifetime and can't afford to wait for uh, ground instructions during, uh, during the blackout times. Um, next slide. Uh, we also expect there to be uh, unprecedented levels of model uncertainty, um, and uh, in particular, uncertainty about the surface material properties um, and what impact that might have on our uh, robotic uh, tasks involved with excavating and sampling from that surface. So we're expecting that the lander is going to have to react to off-nominal conditions, um, and it's going to have to plan on board and change its plans using the, the best available knowledge um, gleaned during execution. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, these challenges motivate having a higher level of, of autonomy on board than we've had in previous missions. Um, in particular, we're interested in incorporating integrated planning and execution. So we wanna be able to use knowledge gained at execution time to drive the planning process. Um, and uh, in particular, we're interested in these techniques of flexible execution and replanning with plan optimization. And uh, in particular, this work that, that I'm talking about today um, involves uh, um, creating a formal model to predict how much improvement in overall mission outcome we might be able to achieve by employing these techniques. So if you go to the next slide, what we have here is an illustration of a basic surface mission that we might perform uh, on, on Europa. So this is a, a high level task network description of, um, of a mission concept. And this is a highly focused mission. So we're, we're basically doing two things. We're, we're performing, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, periodic um, uh, pa uh, panoramas to take images of the Europa surface, and then um, long running uh, seismometry and uh, geophone activities um, and the periodic communication uh, of the data that we get from those back to earth. And then if you move on, um, the other uh, uh, main part of the mission concept is this um, uh, set of sampling tasks. And so on um, 
on the surface of Europa, we, we expect to be looking for uh, biosignatures. And in order to do that, what we expect to do is to excavate off um, a layer of material from the surface uh, that, that, that we might expect has been sterilized by the radiation environment. Um, and then within that excavated area, collect one or more samples of the material underneath, transfer them into a um, compartment on board the lander uh, containing instruments, process and analyze those samples, and then communicate the data um, gener generated from those analyses back down to Earth. Um, can step to the next slide, please. Okay. So we modeled this problem using hierarchical task network to compile the domain specific knowledge of the dependency structure into the task network. Um, in an HTN, hierarchical tasks are composed of a set of subtasks and we refer to these uh, higher level tasks as parent tasks and we refer to their children as subtasks. Parent tasks may decompose into a number of different sets of subtasks. We refer to each of these sets as a potential decomposition of that parent task. And finally, we refer to tasks with no decomposition as primitive tasks. And these primitive tasks represent the tasks that the lander can be directly commanded to perform. Uh, the decompositions provide a number of benefits to our planning approach. They significantly reduce the planned search space. Um, in addition, we can treat all of the subtasks of a parent task as a singular block for planning purposes. So the lander, uh, and, and this is, um, uh, an important concept. The lander only achieves utility after completing an entire sequence of uh, sampling anal analysis and communication. So the goal is to um, you know, send the lander to perform these robotic uh, sampling activities to look for signs of biosignature. And we're, um, we're doing planning work that involves uh, uh, generating a, a, a plan with maximal utility. And that utility is only realized if we can actually get the data um, from the samples back down to earth. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, this describes our utility model. So the, like I said, the ultimate goal for a Europa lander would be to analyze surface material and then communicate the resulting data products back to earth. So to reward the accomplishment of these goals, we assign utility to tasks such as sample excavation and seismographic data collection. But we do not receive this utility until the lander communicates the data down to earth. And in the HTN framework, this means that the tasks in a hierarchy produce utility only if the full hierarchy is executed. So it's important to note that um, the utility is only achieved when the data is downlink back to Earth. And this is true for both the sampling and the seismograph and, and panorama tasks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have a planning and execution framework, which is based on MExec. MExec is an integrated planning and execution system that was originally designed for the Europa Clip for mission. Um, and this provides us with uh, two techniques that we're interested in, um, in analyzing for uh, effectiveness in, in improving mission outcomes. The first is flexible execution. Um, which involves allowing marginal plan changes without uh, failing tasks outright. For example, changing task start time due to uh, delays. And the other is replanning with plan optimization. So this involves updating our system's plan and execution time using up-to-date state knowledge. Uh, for example, um, replanning using measured state values. Uh, um, you can, uh, let's see, so an example of this would be um, you know, if we have a sampling task, we might change our expected value of the energies of that sampling task after uh, um, performing some initial uh, robotic maneuvers and discovering that sampling is more or less difficult than expected, um, or changing the utility of a given sampling target after discovering, let's say, a biosignature at the same site. You can continue to the next slide, please. Um, so as part of our planning process, uh, First, uh, we do a pre-processing step, which uh, flattens the task decompositions into a single layer, such that parent tasks decompose into a chain consisting only of primitive non-hierarchical subtasks. Mm. This allows us to assign utility and energy costs directly to each de decomposition because its breakdown into disparate subtasks has already been performed. Then each decomposition's utility is the sum of each of its subtasks' utility, and the same is true for its energy cost. Uh, this step is performed once per domain model offline. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so 
our planning algorithm uses the hierarchical task network model of the Europa Lander problem um, that I described previously to build a search graph with nodes holding partial plans and edges holding task decompositions. So we perform a heuristic guided branch and brown bound search on this graph and select the best plan uh, that we've explored. The algorithm consists of four phases. So we do, <clears throat> as I previously described, a pre-processing step, an initialization, um, and then this exploration uh, phase that's described here, and then final plan selection. Um, and so we use this uh, heuristic here for deciding um, which, uh, which graph nodes are most uh, appealing um, to explore. And that's a product of the utility of the plan contained, the partial plan contained in that node and the uh, utility of the task that we're proposing adding to that plan divided by its cost in energy. And we're particularly interested in energy costs because as I described, uh, we have a, a finite non-renewable uh, battery. And so um, every, uh, every bit of energy that we use counts. And so uh, with this heuristic, we're favoring tasks that are of a higher utility, um, but for tasks which are of equivalent utilities, we favor those which uh, have a lower energy cost. You can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, the selection step then involves doing search um, on this uh, 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 plan graph uh, bounded by total energy cost. Um, and then we also perform an additional bound on just the total number of candidates that we can explore. And after termination, we choose the plan that we've generated that has the highest overall utility. Um, next slide, please. So we want our planning system to respond intelligently to stochasticity at execution time, since we expect this to be a significant factor in, um, in this domain. So planning execution are integrated in our approach in order to respond to variations that we experience on the surface and therefore better optimize the overall utility achieved in our mission. Um, we achieve this integration through the use of, of two techniques that we're gonna highlight um, in this work. The first is flexible execution, and the second is replanning with plan optimization. Flexible execution is a lightweight rescheduling algorithm that runs at a much higher cadence than the planner. Um, and this algorithm has two main properties. So first, it's significantly less costly than replanning. Um, however, it's also significantly less powerful than replanning. Um, but despite its limited scope, flexible execution is valuable because it can be run so frequently on board. So this allows the system to handle less severe uh, unexpected events without incurring the, the cost of replanning. So in our system, flexible execution consists of two major components. The first is task push. If a task's preconditions are not met before failing the task, we allow it to wait for some amount of time for the inconsistency to resolve. Such a situation might occur, for example, if uh, previous dependencies are unexpectedly delayed. Then we push the start time of that task forward in the plan. Um, task push is implemented as a callback that's run before a task is dispatched to the execution system. The executive checks the task preconditions and delays uh, a dispatch until either the conditions have been met or the task's wait timeout has been exceeded. And the second component of flexible execution is automated retry. So after a task completes with failure, uh, the flexible execution can immediately reschedule that task if its preconditions are still met. The plan is then updated to account for the new predicted end time of the task, as well as additional resource usage. So here the system short circuits a uh, simple failure response, avoiding planning costs for, for failures whenever possible. Um, and in the context of the Europa Lander domain, flexible execution offers significant value despite its simplicity. Uh, because significant noise is expected in resource impacts, providing a low-cost method for handling mismatches in resource use predictions often avoids costs associated with um, either replanning or waiting for ground input. So, for example, if, if let, let's say heating a joint um, on the lander um, is a, a precondition for movement, if we find that heating a joint uh, is slower than predicted, the flexible execution may handle this by just re-triggering the heating operation or delaying the arm movement, uh, either of this, which would be significant to resolve the issue. Uh, on the next slide, um, we're going to talk about the, the other major component, which is replanning with plan optimization. So for more complex failure responses, simple retries might be insufficient. So in these cases, we turn to uh, replanning during execution. And replanning allows the system to make use of online state updates, uh, responding to variation in the original plan's predictions. 
So our framework measures the value of each resource being modeled and then assigns that value to the given resource in the planning model. Then when we're replanning, the planner uses the actual measured value of the state rather than uh, the, the prior. Uh, so this allows us to, up, to update its goals um, according to what's realistically possible given the current state measurements of the system. And then when tasks fail, their predicted state impacts are usually not realized. So replanning provides a mechanism to respond to these problems in, in a more complex manner than just retrying the task. So for example, um, when we do excavation on the surface of Europa, uh, that's a complicated task with a lot of different failure modes. So just retrying that or delaying might be an insufficient response to some of those failure modes, which may require additional actions to be taken in order to, to recover. Um, so, uh, a key point here is that replanning allows the system to make use of additional knowledge gained at execution time. Um, so this might take the form of task model updates. It also might take the form of utility adjustments. So for example, uh, during execution time, the lander might discover that a task consumes more energy than expected, or that it produces more valuable data than expected. Um, in the Europa lander example, um, the system might discover a biosignature at a particular sampling location, which would then drastically uh, change the, the utility um, at that site. Um, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so then in our modeling framework, um, which is sort of the core of this work, we're examining four different planning and execution strategies. So um, we've labeled these static, ground, flexible execution, and replan. So using the static strategy, a plan is generated before execution time and then executed without any changes. Um, so no uh, task failure responses are enabled. So if there are any task failures, those result in the, the termination of the plan execution. In the ground strategy, we introduce a mechanism for failure resolution that involves waiting for ground input. So the Europa, uh, the, the, the lander would communicate to the ground wait a fairly long period of time potentially for the ground to respond uh, with an update that would allow it to uh, uh, resolve whatever issue it's experienced. Um, so we assume that the ground is able to resolve all failures in this model. Uh, the plan is still pre-generated, but task failures can be handled without termination of execution, uh, albeit in a very costly manner. Um, and in the flexible execution strategy, we allow uh, um, uh, flexible execution of our plans, which provides another failure uh, uh, resolution me mechanism. And flexible execution is less costly, but it's able to handle only a fraction of possible failures uh, with other failures handled by ground weight. And then finally, in the replan strategy, we allow for modification of the plan at execution time according to information discovered while running. So this provides another failure resolution mechanism that we assume is more pow powerful than flexible execution, but less powerful than ground weight. Um, and in addition, uh, it allows for the optimization of plans during execution time according to the discovery of new uh, utility. So it serves dual purposes, resolving task failures and, failures and also changing the plan to increase overall utility gain. Uh, so next slide. So we're going to show the components of the model. So given this context, we predict the overall utility achievement of a plan using an estimate of utility per unit cost average. Um, then assuming that the tasks always succeed, our expected utility for a plan would be um, basically that um, average utility per unit energy times the total battery capacity. Uh, but then we factor in uh, task failure, assuming the task fail with some probability. Um, in particular, we assume that task failures follow some Poisson distribution. Um, and then in the static strategy, we see that um, since since uh, um, in this strategy we terminate on the on the first failure, um, the the system's uh, utility achievement is based on how long it could be expected to execute, uh, which is basically just a function of the probability of the failure of any one task. On the next slide, we have our model for the ground strategy, in which we introduce a, a rudimentary error response of, you know, communicating back to the ground to seek manual intervention. Um, to model this in our framework, we assume that these wait for input responses each incur a cost C sub W, and they always allow planet execution to continue. Um, and so this is a, a representation of the utility that we can expect to achieve um, with the uh, ground resolution strategy. Um, and this is uh, builds on the, um, the utility that you, we saw in the static plan with this extra term, um, which basically represents how much utility we're foregoing uh, while we spend energy waiting for the ground to resolve a failure um, and not doing productive work in the meantime. 
um, on the next slide, we have the model for the flexible execution strategy. Um, so we assume that some subset of task failures can be resolved with this feature. Um, and we model the probability of a task failing in that way. Um, and uh, you know, uh, just one thing to note is that the probability of a task failing in a way that's resolvable by flexible execution is a subset of all failures. Um, and so some failures uh, cannot be resolved by flexible execution and will be, need to be uh, handled by the ground. Um, and so this has the same structure then as the model associated with the ground intervention, um, but we gain back some utility for problems that can be resolved via flexible execution uh, at an associated lower cost. And then finally, on the next slide, we have the uh, uh, model for the replan strategy, which incorporates flexible execution and replanning um, with plan optimization. Um, so unlike flexible execution, replanning incurs some non-negligible cost. Um, uh, but we assume that it's available uh, uh, to resolve some subset of task failures um, and, and more uh, a larger subset of task failures than the flexible execution. Um, and uh, as pre previously mentioned, there, there are two components of this, which is that replanning improves the overall utility uh, through, through two mechanisms, uh, more advanced failure recovery and also plan optimization, um, which is modeled by this um, uh, opportunities to discover new utility. Um, and so we've got this term here, D, which is the, the, the number of utility discoveries that we can expect. And then this U sub D is the uh, expected utility uh, value for each of those discoveries. Um, if you move to the next slide, we perform uh, an empirical evaluation of these models. Um, so we performed uh, uh, average utility um, uh, simulated across 50 trials, um, and the for our model calculations, the uh, use of average was determined by analyzing plans from uh, what we refer to as a, a prescient planner, um, which which basically has um, perfect knowledge of task execution. Um, so we we run that once offline in order to model the the utility that we can expect to re uh, receive if everything executes exactly as as expected. Um, and for these tests, we set the failure probability uh, to 0.1 um, and, and uh, the uh, fine, uh, um, flexible execution is capable of resolving 30% of all failures and replanning is capable of resolving an additional 60% uh, of failures. So you can move to the next slide. Um, and uh, what we see is um, for the static strategy, um, the static strategy terminates quickly without a failure resolution mechanism, as you might expect. Um, uh, the ground strategy, uh, we see some uh, improvement in failure resolution, so we can gain a little bit more uh, utility. Um, in the flexible execution strategy, um, we see a little bit more improvement um, because we've got a cheaper failure resolution mechanism on board. And then with the uh, added replanning strategy, uh, we see further improvements to overall uh, mission utility um, because uh, we allow for optimization on utility discovery. And if you move to the last slide, um, so the results uh, from the empirical evaluation generally follow the contour um, as predicted by our model. Um, they over under estimate slightly depending on the uh, strategy that we're employing. Um, and what we proposed here was essentially there's a, there's a spikiness in utility, um, given the fact that we're modeling this, we're using this kind of average utility across the entire task network. Um, but in fact, there, um, there's a distribution of utilities within our task network. They don't, they're not all right at the average. Um, and uh, termination of different parts of the mission may result in, in smaller or larger um, uh, average utility across the, the mission as well. Um, and I think that's, that's all my time. So uh, why don't we go to the last slide? So just in, con in conclusion, um, you know, autonomous system like the one that we're uh, proposing for Europa Lander uh, will have limited supervision. Um, and so we, um, we expected that we'll be relying on high degrees of autonomy. We presented here a model for um, analyzing pros and cons of delegating uh, uh, decisions to the system uh, rather than uh, ground operators. Um, and as the system gains uh, more onboard responsibility, there's um, at least a, an opportunity to, um, to see uh, improved mission outcomes.
Um, and we think that this, uh, this, this sort of flexible execution um, and uh, integrated planning and execution um, will uh, be an enabling technology for, uh, for missions like this with high degrees of, of model uncertainty. Great, that was excellent, uh, Joe. Thank you. Um, and uh, there's three comments in the Q&A and we'll, we'll just do one of them and you can take the other two offline. But the first one is uh, how much time does the four-step replanning algorithm, and I would say how much time and energy does it take uh, and what kinds of tests or demonstrations have you performed? That's that's a, a great question. Um, I don't have numbers specifically on how long the uh, the replanning takes in practice, um, although um, it's it's going to depend very highly on the, the mission model that we're running. Um, and the other question was, what sorts of tests and demonstrations have we performed? So, um, aside from this. Um, this set of empirical evaluations on the model that was sort of the focus of this work. Um, we've been working as, as part of the Europa Lander uh, mission concept, um, trying to um, simulate different, um, a, a few different surface mission uh, models. So the, the basic surface mission that I presented early on in the mission um, was one of them. And we demonstrated some basic uh, uh, flexible execution um, in, in that. And then we're, um, we're working toward um, more sophisticated uh, uh, models of potential future mission that will incorporate um, uh, uh, replanning and a wider variety of um, uh, um, uh, variability in both uh, uh, ground conditions and and uh, and failure modes. All right, great. So. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, remind, there's there's those couple of questions that people are going to be interested in in following up uh, with Slack uh, that we'll move over to Slack. And thanks again, Joe. That was excellent.